In this video, we're going to start our discussion of the new model of the atom known as the Schrodinger model. I've broken up this topic into two separate ideas. First one, in part one, we're going to spend time today justifying why a new model was needed, basically focusing on the problems with Bohr. Uh, and then in the second video, we'll talk about the results, the new model that was created by a fellow by the name of Erwin Schrodinger. Just a quick uh, list of the learning objectives that go along in this video. Uh, we're going to start with a very general topic of atomic models. Um, Overall, um, we're going to review the ideas of what it means to be an atomic model and why we need good atomic models. We're then going to dive right in. Uh, again, the goal is to show that the Bohr model was insufficient and that a new model was needed. Uh, we're going to ta start talking about some of the shortcomings of the Bohr model. and They basically come in the form of some new theories that came on down the pike after the Bohr model was created uh, that started to contradict the picture that Bohr painted. Finally, once we cover those shortcomings, uh, we'll then do a quick preview of what's going to be happening in part two of this video, focusing more on the new model itself, the Schrodinger model. So to get us going, we'll start with a quick rundown of why atomic models are so necessary for a thorough understanding of chemistry. So this is going to be a quick review of some material we talked about earlier in the units. Remember, the goal of an atomic model is to represent the atomic structure, the inner workings of an atom, uh, with a model. And we need this because it's impossible to see inside of an atom. As we talked about earlier, to see things, light needs to reflect off of them in a certain way and then enter our eyes. There's simply nothing inside of an atom uh, for that light to reflect off of, and as a result, we can't see things. Uh, as a result, then, we need a model to represent that internal structure so we can visualize what's happening and hopefully gain a better understanding of the science itself. The second big part of uh, atomic models is be able the ability to predict atomic behavior. Um, primarily focusing there on the physical behavior or the physical characteristics of a substance. Can we figure out things like melting point, boiling point, and other characteristics in advance? And probably more importantly and more commonly used, chemical behavior and characteristics. What type of atoms will my atom react with based on the structure or arrangement of electrons inside of it? Uh, all of these things are tools that are, are things that can be done using a strong model of the atom. The Bohr model can do these things to some extent, uh, the Schrodinger model to a much greater extent. Again, our job today then is to contrast the two models and show why that newer model was necessary. So let's do a quick recap of what the Bohr model itself is, just in case you forget. Uh, these are notes you should already have. I don't necessarily expect you to write them down twice if you feel like you're comfortable. Uh, basically, to run it down, we have electrons traveling in concentric rings around the nucleus. If you recall, this was similar to planetary orbits, the idea that uh, planets orbit the sun and electrons should orbit a nucleus in a similar way. So if you want to look at the model in a literal sense, uh, electrons that are further out in the rings mean they have more energy, and they are also further from the nucleus. Now we've talked about a couple times that these assumptions are not necessarily good ones, but the goal here was to present the, mod the Bohr model as it was originally intended. Now let's move directly into the meat of this discussion, which is talking about the shortcomings of the Bohr model. I'm basically going to introduce a couple new theories that came down the pike after the Bohr model was created, uh, and these new theories started to um, shine some light on the fact that there were some problems with the Bohr model, even though the model itself was capable of doing some good works. So again, just to put this down in writing then, some new discoveries in atomic behavior rendered the model obsolete, so the Bohr model ended up being not as functional as people thought it would be. And those new models through theories are going to be electron-electron repulsion. This was something originally uh, ignored in Bohr's uh, model, and it turned out to be a pretty significant factor. Wave-particle duality, uh, a concept come up by two scientists uh, by the name of Albert Einstein, who should look very familiar, and uh, someone else by the name of de Broglie, a French chemist. Um, basically described the behavior of electrons being far more complex than people realized. And then finally, a big idea by a fellow by the name of Werner Heisenberg, uh, and he came up with something known as Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Well, you take all these ideas and you start mashing them together, and ultimately they were pulled together by another scientist by the name of Erwin Schrödinger, and he translated the very simple picture of atomic rings into a much more complex picture involving some of those uh, images we see down below, different ways of representing locations of electrons in the atom itself. Now let's get into those um, contradictions or those shortcomings uh, one at a time. The first thing we'll talk about is electron-electron repulsion. Now on the left there we have a picture of Bohr's model of the atom shown in 3D. Uh, at the time it was very well known that electrons repel one another. If you recall from earlier in the year, 
uh, electrons all have a negative charge associated with one of each other. When they are close together, that negative charge is going to cause a repulsion force between the two electrons. And as a result, it's going to affect the behavior of those electrons. Now, Bohr knew about this, as we already said, um, but his assumption was that this behavior would be most likely negligible simply because electrons were traveling so fast and they were generally separated by very, very large distances. So high velocities, relatively far distances, basically means that the overall impact on this repulsion stuff is going to be negligible. One of the reasons this was done with the Bohr model is simply for complexity. Uh, calculating those repulsion forces would be very, very difficult to do uh, and require more computing power than they had available at the time. So then the problem this raises for Bohr is that this ended up being a relatively bad assumption. This repulsion force actually had a much larger impact on electron behavior than people realized at the time. Uh, the reason we know this is the case is because when you use the math associated with the Bohr model, it works very great for certain element elements, like say for example the element hydrogen, uh, and it doesn't work great for other elements, pretty much every other element on the periodic table. Hydrogen only has one electron, therefore electron-electron repulsion is not an issue in this case. All other elements have many electrons and as a result that um, repulsion comes into play and the behavior changes significantly enough that Bohr can no longer predict the outcomes of, uh, of those scenarios. So, electron-electron repulsion left out of the Bohr model and as a result it led to data and results from the Bohr model that didn't match up what we saw in the lab. Next in line is a concept of the name of wave particle duality. Uh, this was first thought of um, in not the actual liter literal sense, but in kind of like a discovery kind of sense by Albert Einstein in the year 1905. Uh, he performed an experiment which is now referred to as the photoelectric effect. Um, basically what he was able to show in the photoelectric effect is that when you pass a certain wavelength of light uh, and you expose it to um, a piece of metal, uh, that it can actually eject electrons from the metal. And really what he was doing here was you're starting to blur the boundaries between what it means to be a wave and what it means to be a particle, a, a wave of light versus an electron. This was then further codified by a scientist by the name of Louis de Broglie in 1924, and he's the person that actually coined the term uh, wave-particle duality up here. He's the guy who actually coined the term wave-particle duality. Uh, and basically what he was able to come up with, and there's a lot more to it than this, uh, is that electrons behave both as a particle and as a wave. They are a particle in the sense they have a mass and a location, but they can be described with wave-like characteristics, meaning a wavelength and a frequency. Uh, this applies to any type of small particle, and really what he did was he took things that were considered to be opposites and showed that there was more of a spectrum to it. Uh, for example, light, which we consider to be entirely a wave, actually has particles of light, uh, which were referred to as photons. Likewise, matter, like an electron, has wave-like characteristics, so we think of them as being waves of matter. This very dramatically changed people's perception of what it meant to be an electron, and as a result, the model as well. So again, what are the problems this leads to with the Bohr model itself? Well, the Bohr model treats the electron only as a particle. It's a small chunk of matter flying through space, just like a baseball flying through your backyard. It ignores the wave-like nature of an electron, and as a result of that, it's really generating an incomplete picture of electron behavior. And this means that the model is missing part of what it means to be an atom. It's missing all that wave-like characteristics that an electron has. As a result, we can't necessarily expect the Bohr model to make accurate predictions about electron behavior if it's missing all of this information. Our last topic we're going to cover then uh, in terms of contradictions to the Bohr model would be Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And this is one of the most difficult to understand, uh, but also one of the more interesting things that come down the pike uh, in order to contradict with Bohr. Uh, basically, it talks about the concept of uncertainty, meaning when we make a measurement, it's not exactly right. It's always a little high or a little low. And originally, scientists assumed that this quality of measurement um, came back totally towards the quality of the measuring tool, much like we talked about earlier in the year um, with significant digits. So if you have a better measuring tool, you get more decimal places. If you have a poorer measuring tool, you get fewer decimal places. And hypothetically, if you had a perfect measuring tool, you would get perfect measurements. Well, what Heisenberg came up with was the concept that this uncertainty in our measurements does not solely come from the quality of our measuring device. The nature of an electron and other similar particles means that there will always be uncertainty in the measurement of the position and momentum, even with the perfect measuring tool. This basically means it is impossible to make what we would call a hypothetical and perfect measurement, not because of any kind of ideal situation of measuring tools, but because of the nature of the matter itself. We cannot make those quality of measurements. And Heisenberg was actually able to quantify this, strangely enough, and this is the part that always throws me for a bit of a loop. He created this equation here, 
which basically shows that the uncertainty in the position measurement, which is this guy right here, times the uncertainty in the momentum measurement must always be greater than or equal to, so the product of the uncertainty here, h over 2. This is known as the reduced Planck's constant. I believe it's divided by 2 pi, so it's h over 2 pi. So there's a fixed bottom level, and this is as good as measurements can ever be, and it also implies that the better I make one particular measurement, because it's a direct relationship, the poorer I must be making the other measurements. And the philosophy behind this was that the electron themselves is so dramatically affected by measuring tools, in this case, if you recall in this chapter, the measuring tool for atoms is light. Electrons are so dramatically measured, the more I try and measure it, i.e. the better position data I try to record, the more I'm messing up my electron, the more I'm causing causing it to behave differently, and as a result, it becomes impossible then to measure the momentum data. So it's basically one or the other, or at least a balance between the two of those. In result, basically, in short, we can never know where an electron is or what it's specifically doing. We can only predict likely locations and likely behavior. We are limited in what we can know about electrons. Again, translating this back to the Bohr model, uh, Bohr places electrons in very predictable concentric rings. They orbit the planet. Now, if you know anything about astronomy, we can predict the location of every single planet on any single day in any single part of our uh, calendar because we know exactly what it's doing. Heisenberg says that that doesn't work for electrons. We cannot know that it's true that an electron is traveling on that ring. And because we can never know that it's true, it's unreasonable to make this sort of an assumption. In reality, electron orbits are actually extremely complicated. They don't follow predictable paths as we would normally expect. And as a result, if you want to figure out what an electron is, what it's doing, it's more about predicting reasonable or probable paths than it is actual positions. All right, well, that pretty much brings us to the end of our discussion on the, uh, the contradictions in the Bohr model itself. It's time for us to move instead uh, into a preview of where we're heading next with this. All of these problems led new scientists to realize a new model was necessary, and the scientist that kind of took the bull by the horns here and created something new and better was a fellow by the name of Erwin Schrödinger. He created what's now known as the Schrödinger model, or the Schrödinger wave equation. Basically what Schrodinger did, he took the best of Bohr, it had some good stuff into it, it made sense, and there were some things that actually clicked, but just not everything. He then folded in all the stuff we just talked about. He included electron-electron repulsion in that behavior. He included wave-particle duality, and he included Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And most of this stuff was included in the form of probability functions. Uh, not to say that an electron is doing this, but to say that an electron is likely doing this. And as a result, we went from this very simple model, a picture of the Bohr model over here, which we no longer use anymore, to a much more complex, but also much more reflective of real atoms, picture over here. And what we see now is these three-dimensional shapes surrounding the nucleus in the center, and those represent likely areas that our electron can be found in at any given point in time. Now clearly we have to talk about this in a lot more detail. I simply wanted to provide you with a little preview of where things are happening in part two of our video. Just to wrap things up, a uh, quick list of the things you should be able to do at this point. Uh, you should be able to describe the th uh, three theories that showed, not shewed, but showed flaws in the Bohr model itself. You should be able to discuss electron-electron repulsion, you should be able to discuss wave-particle duality, and you should be able to discuss Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And all three of these you should be able to relate back to the Bohr model as well, explain why they showed the Bohr model was lacking in its description of atomic behavior. In class, we'll spend a little bit more time talking about some of these theories. They've introduced some very fascinating physics and um, philosophical discussions, and hopefully we'll be able to kind of explore that a little bit, especially Heisenberg's uncertainty principle.